Well, welcome. It's wonderful to see so many of you crammed in this little alley-like room. I'm going to take you on a tour today of Django's Nasal Passage, a journey from its stock test equipment to a fast, boilerplate-free world that you can enjoy with a flip of a few switches. First, a little bit of context. I work at Vodizen, a startup that aims to reduce the influence of big money in politics. And to do that, we're going to try to substitute more efficient, cheaper social media connections for traditional, more expensive channels like TV and radio and like robocalls where you need a billion dollars just to ante up. So through this, we hope to give third parties and, and grassroots movements a chance. But when you try to model the political process in a, in a rigid thing like programming, things get hairy pretty quickly. So we do some fairly intense testing. We got about 1,700 tests right now. And we found that the stock Django test framework, while it's easy to get started with, quickly becomes a limiting factor as you scale up. There's a couple of pain points. So almost immediately, you end up with far too many tests for one little test stop pie module. So of course, you promote that into a package, right? You end up with a tests folder, an init in that, and you kind of pull up and import all the little tests up into init. This is annoying, and it gets error prone, as we'll see shortly. Second of all, the default test equipment tends to be slow. There's a full flush for each test in a transaction test case. There's a full fixture reload for each test in a test case that uses fixtures. And the uh, test runner creates a whole fresh set of databases at every invocation. Third, the thing gets overzealous. It ends up testing everything that happens to be in installed apps. And there's not a whole lot of point to that in most cases. At best, you end up testing that the known good third-party stuff that you're using is configured right. And in the usual case, you're just wasting cycles for no reason. Uh, fourth, I find the testing UI to be unnecessarily rough. You don't get any tracebacks till everything is done. You don't know when it's going to be done. And the tracebacks themselves are full of trash, equal signs and other crap that just slows you down. And finally, the extensibility scale, while it exists for the Django test runner, isn't very scalable and is, uh, isn't really recouplable. So for example, if I had a fancy little Django test runner subclass that maybe did XML output for something like Jenkins, uh, you wouldn't be able to use it if you too had subclassed it. They don't just mix together. You'd have to do some gluing. Nose is going to help us solve all of this. So before we dive into the capabilities, uh, let's just see how to install it. It's real quick. You pip install Django Nose, which is a little shim that just implements a Django test runner and then kind of dispatches out to Nose. Second, you just uh, stick Django Nose in your installed apps and set up your test runner. So far, so good. And then you simply invoke your tests as usual with manage.py test. Now let's see what you get. First, brevity. Where Django stock test runner makes you pull all that stuff up into tests init.py like this, Nose makes it look like this. How does it do that? Well, Nose finds your tests, yeah, I like this a lot better, by name, specifically by means of this regular expression, which is a lot easier to understand by examples. So if this regex matches a class or function, which is in a module whose name also matches this regex, it considers that to be a test. Uh, these are some test-like names, tests on the left, test module names on the right. Typically, it's, it's, uh, basically, it's when the word test occurs after a uh, word break. If you have something that doesn't fit the pattern as a one-off, you can decorate it with one of these decorators and say, yeah, it is, no, it isn't. If you don't like the pattern, you can pass dash M when you run the test runner, or you can write a short five to 10 line discovery plugin for nodes that changes the pattern however you like. Of course, subclasses of unit test .test case are always considered tests so that your old Django tests continue to work. In addition to making things shorter, this eliminates several classes of errors. So for one thing, we get rid of this accidental shadowing. So when you're hoisting all this stuff up into init, if the things have similar names across modules, like for example, maybe, oh, I don't know, basic tests or integration tests or something, if you have a test case called that in two different modules and you just import it blithely with an import star into init, one of those is going to get shadowed and it'll never get run. You'll never get an error message and it'll sit there unused and not helping you for six months, bit rotting. We've actually had that happen to us a couple of times. Uh, as a corollary to that, you avoid having these absurdly long Java-like names in order just to satisfy that uniqueness constraint. And then, of course, sometimes we just flat out forget to import stuff into in it. You know, why should I have to remember this? I'm a monkey, not a computer that's good at mechanical stuff. 
So as a bonus, since we've cleared out init and got rid of its, its uh, need to act as kind of an import nexus, you're free to import down from it into these test modules, right? So you can put your base classes and other utility functions in init and just kind of reverse that direction of import. So as I hinted earlier, Django knows limits its discovery to your own project directory. That means that it tests only your code, saving you a bunch of time every time you test. Incidentally, that means you can have code in your Django project that doesn't live in an app and yet is still under test. It'll be found just fine. So what do you end up with? Well, I don't like to throw out the baby with the bathwater, so uh, this looks pretty much like Django standard stuff, except that it's going to be blank. I call things test this, test that, because it makes them clump together in my file system viewer and uh, makes things like sample data stand out. But there's nothing saying you can't turn it around and say model tests, view tests. Again, that matches that regex, so Nose is perfectly happy to find those. That's a little easier for type to select. Either way, it's faster, less error prone, and fewer lines of code than the Django stock stuff. Now, when you run your tests uh, using Django Nose, the spelling is a little bit different. So here in Django is how you would select a specific test to run. Uh, in Nose, since it's more general, it's a little bit longer. You have the tests directory in there. You have the test module in there. And this is a strange case. Usually you just say your app name and you're done with it, and it's the same as Django. Uh, as a constellation, though, you can run all the tests in one module all at once, a trick that, as far as I know, the Django test runner doesn't offer, so you can do that. So this wraps up the boilerplate killing portion of our program. Now we get to dig into some ways where Nose goes far beyond the functionality of plain old unit test. First, functions as tests. Now, if you don't need any setup or teardown, you can just stick your test as a top-level function, just run the top-level of a module. Now, of course, since there's no self here, there's no self.assert equal and all of its friends, so you just use this top-level equal function and its brethren that Nose provides. There are allowances for setup and teardown if you want to do that. I've never done it. I consider it exotic, but here's what it looks like. You got a decorator, you pass it a setup function, a teardown function, and away you go. So next time you find yourself trying to figure out which class to shoehorn kind of a misfit test into, just, just don't. Just, just put it out here in, in module space. I'll be perfectly happy. There's also, and this is another odd bird, package and module level setup and teardown. So if you put a routine called setup in the, at the top level of a module, that'll run before the first test in the module runs. Similarly, the teardown will run after the last test in the module runs. And then if you put those things uh, set up and tear down in an init of a package, those will run similarly before and after the first test in the package runs. Now here's a really cool thing. If you have data-driven tests, Sometimes that's a really nice pattern to have, especially if you have something intricately mathematical like a fuzzy matcher or maybe something that extracts nicknames given a set of heuristics from Latin-like names. Um, sometimes you want to test not a series of branches that you can document easily in a bunch of separate tests with doc strings, but rather a series of sanity checks. Make sure Steven is Steve. Make sure Rosalind is Roe. Uh, now, in unit test, you might imagine sticking this in a for loop and saying, okay, assert this, assert this, assert this, assert this. The trouble with that is, when your first assertion fails, you're done with the test. The whole thing is kaput. All you see is the first failure. Now, with nose, you can have a test generator, which means that instead of making an assertion, you yield a callable, and then you yield the parameters that get passed to that callable. And each of these things you yield ends up acting just like a separate test. So let's say all of my data failed, all of my little assertions failed, the test output finally would say, well, look, check datum with these parameters failed and check datum with these other parameters failed. It'd be very easy to uh, read and track and go fix. The only caveat is that you can't use this within a test case subclass, but it's good everywhere else. Top of the module, any other classes, you're good to go. Sometimes it's nice to be able to split up your tests into sets and maybe run your Selenium tests on a continuous integration box and some other tests uh, just on your development machine. Well, here's how you can do it. Nose provides this attribute plugin. You can say, this is a Selenium test. And then you can say, just run the Selenium tests. You can also say, just run not the Selenium tests. Perfectly nice. But uh, the attributes can also be valued. For example, speed equals slow. And you can say, I would like to run the tests where speed equals slow. And you could say, Boolean expressions, like I would like to run the uh, Selenium tests that are slow. or for completeness, the Selenium tests or the slow tests. Carve it up however you like. The Selenium thing is a handy thing. Uh, speed can be a handy thing. Can be uh, used to delineate what your smoke tests are. Run these quick, see if something breaks. Save my developer time. 
Of course, XML output is built in, so you don't have to use some little Django snippets version of XML output for Jenkins or Cruise Control. Just pass dash dash with X unit, and you're all good. If you don't like the default file output, which is nose tests.xml, just pass a little file name, and you get this nice little output about gerbils. Oh, uh, word to the wise. Always pass dash s when you're using nose, because otherwise, nose has this little output capture feature where anything that gets blown out to standard out, like debug prints and PDB uh, breaks, will get eaten until the test is proven to fail. I guess the authors of nose put a lot of debug prints in. So anyway, always pass dash s, and you won't wonder why your tests hang at an invisible PDB point. I like to put it into my uh, shell alias that I use to launch my tests. There's also a nose RC file you can use for uh, you know, global preferences across projects on your box, and then there's also uh, Django Nose provides a setting you can stick in your app settings so you don't have to tell all your developers to do this. Lots of other goodies. Uh, Chad, we only have a, a short time here, but there are custom error classes, like uh, you know, we have failure, error, and skip. Well, you can make your own. You can make like a to-do class that represents, perhaps, uh, if you're doing test-driven development, maybe I committed a test that I had perfectly good, but I didn't get time to implement it, and I'm getting on a plane, and I want to pass it off to my team, so I implement it, and I have it like raised to-do or something, and it shows up as a T. Uh, very extensible, lots and lots of hooks. Um, I'll be talking about my sprint later. You should come to my tiny little five-hour sprint, and I'll show you how to write a nose plugin. There are a healthy ecosystem of plugins around for doing just about anything. I'll show you lots of them here. There's parallelization. Haven't got this working with Django yet due to database contention and a couple other little niggles, but uh, you can farm this thing out across processors, and it parallelizes, and it's happy. There are even, there's even cleverness in it for showing which tests must be run together on the same processor. There's all the slicing people have thought about. So let's talk about speed a bit. Earlier when I said uh, Django Nose was just a shim, I was lying to you. Though it actually started out that way, now it has all kinds of crazy performance enhancing, uh, performance -enhancing features. And uh, almost all of those are implemented as straight Nose plugins. Very clean, combinable, no monkey patching evil. To demonstrate the speed features, I'm gonna use the example of support.mozilla.org, affectionately nicknamed Sumo. It has about 1,200 tests. And over time, the tests have grown to take 20 minutes on the build server, five minutes on the local box. Now, five minutes doesn't sound like long when you just say, oh, five minutes. But it's worth saying a few words about why that hurts. First and most obviously, um, having shorter tests will save you all the sword fighting time while the tests run. More importantly, it saves you the time recovering from that, uh, recovering from your context switch, reestablishing your mental flow, it removes the temptation to not run the tests or to run only some of the tests. I know, uh, I know you've never done this, but I've sometimes made a little change in an app and I only run that app's tests. Say, oh, nothing, what could possibly go wrong, right? Well, <laughs> you break the build, that's what goes wrong. And then now you've wasted not only your own time, but your team's time and your build server time, backed up the queue and everybody's sad and you wasted four minutes. So where do we go looking for the speed we want? We can knock it down, I promise, from five minutes down to one minute well, there's usually only one question, or one, uh, one answer to that, and that's always I.O. It's always I.O. Your problem is always I.O. Here's why it's always I.O. On this chart, one pixel represents one nanosecond of access time. Now, take a look at this. The first three levels of memory hierarchy all the way down to core are completely blown away by this mechanical spinning hard disk time. It hurts to go to hard disk. You can do as much thinking as you want as long as you don't hit the hard disk. It's almost as true for SSDs though an SSD has on the order of 100 nanosecond access time, so you know, a little bit slower than RAM in theory, uh, writes get amplified, and file system uh, overhead is not to be uh, dismissed. So for example, if you're on a really bad file system like HFS Plus, like I am, uh, you've got not only you know, normal file system overhead, but you've got to contend with the fact that HFS Plus is a single global write lock. There can only be one in-flight write call to HFS Plus at a time. Databases love this, it's fantastic. So you do a little bit of digging with the Unix time command. You say, oh, I'm only spending 30% of my time in CPU. I must be wasting the rest in I.O. or something else. And you dig a little bit deeper, and you confirm it's database I.O. You can watch MySQL spin CPU, or you can bring up LSOF and see what files are uh, going on. So because it's always I.O., Django Nose provides four optimizations for reducing it. The first is fast fixture test case. Here's a test fixture. Who uses test fixtures? Stop it. But if you use them, this will make them go fast. Uh, this one is from Sumo. It's 39 objects. It turns into 39 SQL insert statements. 
Uh, the trouble is, even in Django 1.4, you can't use bulk inserts to make that fewer because what if your models do stuff on save? What if they do stuff on post save hooks? Bulk will completely skip all that stuff, leaving a weird inconsistent state. So we're stuck with 39 insert statements. <laughs> Boo. Here's the test case that uses that harness and two others. About similar sizes, maybe, I don't know, 100, it's called 100 insert statements. Now, when we actually ran this test case, which has several tests, the whole thing took four minutes to run. And most of that was I.O. What the heck is going on? That's way too long for like 100 SQL insert statements, right? So here's what's going on. Uh, if, you've so, if you uh, boot up MySQL as MySQL root user, type this in, it starts spewing out every statement it sees to a little log file. You can tail that and see exactly what's going on. And what turns out to be going on is that Django is quite happily reloading the fixtures before each test because it's conservative. It begins the test, it loads the fixtures, it runs the test, and then it rolls back the transaction to bring you to a, a clean, empty database. It's very tidy, but very inefficient. So run, roll back, run, roll back, load them, roll them back, load them. So you can see this uh, is, tends to wear on you after a while. In fact, on Sumo, this came out to a total of 37,583 database queries. It seemed to me that we could do a lot better. Here's how we can do a lot better. This is a conceptual mock-up of Fast Fixture Test Case. We use Unit Test 2's handy little setup class and teardown class things that only went once per class. And Nose supports these two, support them for a long time. Uh, in setup class, we load the fixtures and we commit. There's the difference. We actually commit these things. Then when it comes time to run a test, we run the test and then we roll back. Now the difference is now rollback takes us to a pristine set of test fixtures, not to a big empty database. So we do that a bunch of times, and finally when it comes time to tear down our stuff, we remove the text fix test fixtures explicitly. How do we figure out what to remove? That's a tricky bit. Well, we run a version of Django's load data command, which doesn't load any data, it's been neutered, but what it does do is report on what would have been loaded. So we figure out what would have been loaded, we unload it, and then we commit and we're back to a nice blank database. So how does this affect us? With the stock stuff, Sumo fired off 37,000 queries. With per class fixtures, fast fixture test, fast test case, teeny tiny, 4,000. That's nine times less traffic to MySQL. Or to look at it in terms of time, we have our stock fixtures taking about five minutes and our per class fixtures taking about one and a half minutes. So to get these improvements in your project, all you have to do is subclass fast fixture test case instead of the normal test case. Uh, with the caveat that if you have post-save handlers on your uh, fixture objects that are going to create more objects, uh, you can't do it. That'll confuse things. Uh, there's also an additional four seconds saved in Django knows by reusing a database connection. Uh, Django likes to flap the database connection open and closed all the time, so that actually takes us down to 93 seconds instead of 97. So big improvement, and all thanks to getting rid of I.O., as usual. But there are additional speed optimizations we can enjoy, like fixture bundling, which is a quite exotic little bird. These are three actual test cases from Sumo. I mean, they're longer in person. Um, you can imagine how you might optimize these since they all use the same set of test fixtures. Now remember, we're loading our fixtures once per class. So what if we merge all three of these into one class, right? That would certainly work, but it would make me cry because we wouldn't be able to then conceptually categorize our stuff like we wanted to before. We'd have to have one file, et cetera, et cetera. But we can get speed anyway by taking advantage of Nose's opportunities for dynamism. <sighs> We're going to use a neat little hook called prepare test. That's the Nose hook. Now it's called it's uh, it's named kind of misleadingly. It should be called prepare test suite because it gets called once and passed the entire test suite. Here is how uh, Nose typically runs your test classes, basically in alphabetical order without regard to anything else. Now the trouble, of course, is that we load fixtures A, B, and C in test case one, then we unload them, then we load A, B, C, and D in test case two, then we unload them, and then we redundantly load A, B, and C again in test case three. That's very sad. But by using this prepared test hook, we can write a plugin to dynamically reorder them like this, factoring out pointlessly repeated setup. In the future, you could even imagine uh, observing subsets and not resetting up A, B, and C when it comes time to do test case two. Here are the points where it loads. We load there, and then test case three and test case six get to enjoy them. Test case six is informed uh, in a decoupled way that it's the last in the group, and so it takes, it takes uh, responsibility for tearing things down. 
And then test case two is informed that it's the first in a group, sets up. And then we load the last set just like that. Now the reordering should not affect your tests. We're preserving test independence throughout this. But if you leak state uh, from your tests, this can, um, it can show you where you have state leaks and test interdependencies. And the usual culprits for this are you know, singletons of any kind, module level globals, thread locals, uh, and the locale stuff in Django, which sets up a lot of thread locals. So if you set like a, a um, locale and then uh, are testing an exception, you have a request in a test client that throws an exception, you may not reset that correctly. So make sure you're always resetting locale stuff. So what impact does fixture bundling have in the case of Sumo? Well, before bundling, we had 114 classes with fixtures, so we did the loading and unloading 114 times. But as it turns out, there were only 11 distinct sets of test fixtures, mostly due to deep subclassing. So with bundling, we only do it 11 times, and that hacks a quarter off of our already improved test period. How can you do it yourself? Well, just subclass fast fixture test case and pass dash dash with fixture bundling when you run your tests. Waiting for database setup sucks, especially for trivial tests like, you know, one plus one equals two. Why, sh why should I wait for database for that, right? Why also should I wait 15 seconds for database setup when the database was perfectly valid at the end of my last test run? I mean, all that was in there is a bunch of Django content type rows and, and empty uh, model tables. So why not reuse that stuff? We can skip the teardown of the test database and then symmetrically skip its setup on future test runs. When we do that, we see that we start there and we hack another 12 seconds off the test run time. Here's how you do it. Uh, I'm sorry to say it's an environment variable. It's really hard to tunnel those args through correctly. I keep trying every so often and then I usually throw up my hands in despair. Uh, Patch is welcome. One other caveat, it's not very observant. So when you have a schema change, if you change your models, you need to remember to omit the reuse flag the next time you run it and it'll drop and recreate the databases once. So that brings us within just a whisker of the one minute test run, which is about as much as I can stand. Here's our pursuit of speed so far. We started with stock Django, five minutes, cut that way down with test fixtures. And then we cut that way down with fixture bundling. And then we hacked a little bit off that with database reuse, and uh, we're saving four minutes of test run, as promised. Now, that may not sound like much, but it really adds up. Uh, on Sumo, I had a team size of four, and if we conservatively say that we each ran the test suite maybe four times a day, uh, we saved four minutes each, that's 64 minutes a day total. That comes out to 261 programmer hours a year, or 32 working days, which means that essentially we can take an extra week off each per year. <laughs> So if you have lots of fixture-heavy tests and like your vacation, be sure to grab Django Nose and turn all the stuff on. But there's just one more thing. We just talked about the most expensive, horrible database operation that you can possibly do, dropping the whole thing and then recreating it from scratch. Horribly enough, this is what happens before every single transaction test case test. Because transaction test cases, of course, are ones that are allowed to commit for real to the database. Now, the need for the database flush is evident enough. If the test runner is going to guarantee a clean database, uh, at some point, it has to either track what it's doing and back it out, like that other machinery did, or else nuke it from orbit, which is the easy way out, which is what the uh, Django stuff does. Uh, oddly, for reasons that have been lost to history, transaction test cases flush the database before they run rather than after. So you can imagine what happens. They, they, leave a, they, leave a, they flush, they do their thing, and then they leave a mess in the database. Now, if you had a normal test case come after that, it would be terribly surprised at all this crap in the database and probably fail in funny ways, or you'd end up you know, with test dependencies that uh, bite you later on. So what Django does is it makes sure to run all the transaction test cases last. They all take care of themselves. They flush before running. So if you stick them all last, at least nobody will be surprised. Of course, that gets rid of a lot of our other optimizations. It gets rid of uh, the ability to use reuse DB, for example. Um, wouldn't it be nice if we could voluntarily write transaction test cases that were more responsible, hygienic, if you will, and thereby opt out of all this flushing madness? Well, we can do that. And we can save sometimes upwards of 30 seconds to a minute per test in a transaction test case. Here's how you do it. First, write a transaction test case that cleans up after itself. 
that's left as an exercise to the reader for now, but generally you know which tables you're stomping on, so just truncate them at worst, right? You're still saving time. Next, set the little cleanup after itself bit. Set that to true. That just advises Django knows that you're a responsible citizen. And then override uh, fixture setup and be sure to omit that flush command. Now I'm gonna add a, a, a nice little base class that does a lot of this for you to Django knows in a future release. Um, yeah, so as a result, these things can be run in any order. So it stops pushing them all to the end. In fact, it makes sure that they are ahead of the ones that actually leave crap in the database so that they can all avoid pre-flushing. That wraps up the computer speed portion of our program. But what about human speed? What about having a decent UI for running tests? I don't know why we hurt ourselves with all these dots. I want my tests to be informative while they're running, informative after they're done running, and I want them to actively help me to diagnose and debug what goes wrong. Here's our current state of affairs. Standard Django test display. It's basically what we get from standard unit test. It's uh, text test runner. I took the liberty of uh, trimming out some of the time here. This isn't quite real time. Now, we can see I just got an error there. I wonder what it is. I'd like to start working on it, but I don't know what it is. I'm not gonna see until the end. In fact, I don't know when the end is coming. <laughs> Should I get a sandwich? Should I get married? I, I don't know. So uh, yeah, I'm just gonna hang out. This is like two minutes, so just, just chill out. No, not really. Um, so when we finally finish all this stuff, we're left with this wrapped around, pile of garbage that says, you know, file such and such and a heinous error and I can't find my function names, they're all different columns and it's a big mess and the line numbers are hidden, they're not lined up or colored or anything. And there's big equal signs taking up space and scrolling the useful stuff off my terminal. It drives me crazy. What a waste of time. This is not, as my friend Chris says, talking monkey work. This stuff is what the computer should be doing for me. Make my job easy. Thank you. Let me think. Uh, this is what I would rather have. This is a plugin called Nose Progressive that I put together. Pass with progressive to the test runner, and you get this nice little progress bar down at the lower right. You get your tracebacks as you're running. You get to always see over to the left of the progress bar the name of the currently running test and where it is. So you can kind of spot slow tests that way sometimes. It's nice. Um, also, the tracebacks themselves are a bit unusual, as you, might, uh, as you might notice. First of all, I saved a lot of lines. I got rid of all those equal signs. I got rid of all those traceback, most recent line last, as if you've never seen a traceback before. And in bold, right after the fail, that's something that you can, uh, you know, depending on your terminal, double click and round trip back to manage.test or manage test to run that test again. So you have already a round trip back to retrying a failed test. Oh, what else have we got here? The paths. The paths are relativized optionally so that uh, horizontal space is conserved. The function names are uh, in blue here. You can customize all these colors so that you can scan from stack frame to stack frame and keep your place. Also, uh, we omit junk stack frames. So we omit, of course, anything that's a unit test internal. And in fact, the first line of every traceback is guaranteed to be your test code. Notice that each one of these things is a test. So you can always say, well, I, I probably made a mistake in my test. It's probably not something, you know, it's probably like not the mock lib that's screwing up. Just double click that. And if you notice, it starts with an editor name, that's an editor shortcut. Watch this. If you triple click on that, give it a quick copy, paste, up pops your editor right at that line. This works in VI, Emacs, BBEdit, TextMate, anything that obeys that little plus command line syntax for saying I want you to come and edit at this line. So to get all this in your project, you just pip install nose progressive and make sure you pass dash dash with progressive when you run your tests. It also works great when you're not using Django. It works with any, uh, any project you care to use nose with and uh, that's a very easy thing to do. You just run the nose tests command line thing, it finds your tests and runs them, even if the author didn't intend that to be done. So there are some great future things coming down the pipe here. We've got uh, test only models. Now I made some provision for these in the current Django nose. Uh, sometimes it's nice to make a model that's used only during test. For example, to subclass a uh, mix-in and make sure it's behaving correctly. This is really tough mentally in uh, Django as it stands right now. And though I've documented it in the README and I, I have what I thought was a best practice at the time in there, 
It's actually a bad idea. So hold off on that. I'm going to try to solve this problem once and for all and do it efficiently so we don't end up flushing entire databases to do it. Uh, coverage and profiling. Now you can do like dash dash with coverage, dash dash with profile for nodes. Um, right now it lies to you about the numbers. There are some subtle interactions where the numbers aren't quite right. That's a bug we got to fix. And I want to add uh, better Django 1.4 or project layout support. Sometimes you have to pass uh, dash dash traverse namespace if you want to specify a specific app in a Django 1.4 project. So there's lots of new potential. I'm behind on that review queue. Lots of good patches in there. We're going to have a short sprint tomorrow from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. to see how far we can get merging those patches. And that brings us to the end today. Thank you very much. Do we have any burning questions? <laughs> so um, Nose Progressive looked really great, and so does Nose. Um, but I'm curious if there's any uh, integration or plans for integration with PyCharm. PyCharm. The IDE. Do you use PyCharm? Yes. Will you come to the Sprint and integrate it? I'm afraid I don't use PyCharm. How would you, uh, yeah, you need to come and uh, let's talk afterwards and you can explain to me how you'd like it to be integrated and how I can make that easier. Um, okay, so the thing that's a little unclear to me is how much of this is actually knows? <laughs> how, how much of this is actually knows specific and how mm -hmm. much of it is uh, cleanups in terms of the way our test case is executed in, um, in Django. I mean, for example, the test yep. discovery stuff, I admit at the moment, is a, is a hideous mess. It's also something that can be fixed because unit test 2 has much better uh, test discovery and it's something that there's a patch that's about yay far away from being probably merged into. I look forward to that being rolled into Django. So that becomes, you know, then, then if that's the only reason we've got nose involved, why the rest of it doesn't, didn't look specifically like it was nose directed. It was, you know, yes. making, making test classes that load fixtures in a better way and that, and that sort of thing, which is also possible in unit test 2 because you've got per class setups and things like that. So yep, that's a very good question. Uh, what is no specific is the things like the attribute plugin up top, uh, all that stuff about discovery, and uh, basically everything up to um, the fixture stuff was, was no specific, usable in any project apart from Django, with Django, whatever. Uh, the Django no specific stuff, as well as being a shim, was all that speed stuff. And then nose progressive is nose progressive. I hope. Uh, I hope to take more advantage of unit test two as Django takes advantage of it. I'm going to roll forward with that, uh, as long as it doesn't uh, get rid of nose functionality that I'd miss. Now, there's a nose two coming out that people are working on at various paces that is going to be based on unit test two and then add whatever icing wasn't there. Any others? Well, great. Thank you very much.